This week's sponsor, KR Couriers and Transport Limited, are best known as being a Northwest based company who deliver newspapers and magazines for local news agents and superstores. You'll find all the information within the description. Please give them a follow. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Billy Moore podcast and once again, John Burton, he's back on, part two, how nice are we John? You, Billy, nice to okay. Once again, thanks for coming on. Ah, no worries. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, good, um, tired but good. So tell us a little bit about what's been going on since <coughs> the last podcast. Um, oh God, um, it's loads been going on, we're just doing more training, um, getting into more prisons now, we had a bit of an headache with uh, Covid. Um, obviously, yeah. once COVID come, all the prisons sort of locked down. We had to just look at a different way of doing things. So we started doing more people, mm-hmm. uh, offenders coming out, uh, working with care workers, uh, care lads, uh, girls. It was just look at everything you can do and crack on. I think we after the lockdown, I think we probably six or seven months we got training again. Um, we've just grown from there. It was listen, it was really difficult through lockdown. Um, obviously, when you haven't got funds and stuff like that. It, it does get really, really difficult, and I think we we we, were, we weren't far off of of going under, but we managed to get through it, and um, we're just flourishing now and everything we're doing. Love it, mate. It's great. Brilliant. So you were quite popular. There's a lot of um, people asking me to to get you back on for the part two, because uh, your stories were quite like you know interesting and, and intriguing. And, it's just and like we've grew up, isn't it? It is. Yeah, and um, you know you were recently on a uh, Liverpool Narcos. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that, John, because I never even knew you were on that. Do you know what 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 that was first? It was never to, one. It was never to be called Liverpool Narcos. No. And two, um, I got asked to go on it. Um, I agreed to it, obviously, because it was all about. I had I had a, a written agreement with them that everything I'd done in it would lead to where I was going and what I was doing today, um, which they stuck to. But I had my kids in it. Um, my kids were telling other people about the effects it had on them when I went to prison or the effects it had on them travelling all around the country to come and see the dad for an hour or something. I had all that in it. And when I found out it was called Liverpool Narcos, I just said, nah, just take my kids out. Because I was in episode one, eh, most of two, uh, and some of three as well. And when I heard it was sort of Liverpool Narcos, it just... Well, well, I didn't want my kids in that, if you get me. If it's being kept like Liverpool grafters or something like that. <clears throat> that to shout initially? Yeah, yeah. And then obviously three months, I think it was about three months before the years, eh, they phoned me up and just said, look, um, we've, we've spoke with the uh, producers and stuff and they want to call it Liverpool Narcos. And obviously there's already been a Liverpool Narcos on um, Channel 5. with um, Who was in that one? That was Jason and Ian. Uh, Fitz. Yeah, and yeah. It was on Channel 5 a while ago and then, you know what, I've done it because... I wanted to show people that people can change if you get the right roots to change and you've got the right mentality to change because everyone's not ready for work, Billy. You know yourself. <laughs> no. you're, you're in prison. You come out, you're used to earning money or you're used to being on the gear or you're used to being on drugs or some sort. You're used to robbing or, yeah. you know, you've got to get your ways. And when we all grew up, we got our ways out to make money. Different people went different ways. But when you come out, especially nowadays, it's difficult out here. And to come out, you probably need six or 12 months to get your life fully in order if you've come out to nothing. I don't know. Sometimes I think, you know, the, the longer you're away, the more time you need to, to, to kind adjust. of to adjust. Yeah. Because there's people who've been away for decades, mm. literally, and there's people that have been away for a couple of years. You know, and you get out and the feeling, you know, the, the, initially you get out of prison and you're feeling really what, you, know, you feel insecure about yeah, yeah. your financial affairs. You know, you think relationships are going to fix you. You think everything outside of you is what is going to work. But if you've got no skills, you, you, you basically you're fucked. It, it's aren't you? hard. And look, I I done six years where I didn't really get out. And for me, it was it was a culture shock when I come home. I was coming home and sitting in my bedroom and stuff like that. Where you 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 know yourself when you come out, you don't really want to be around loads of people. You might have a night out for coming home, but then you sort of seclude yourself away from everyone so you're getting your own head in order. And 
I had I had my own house and stuff what I was renting, but every time I come in of a night, I'd be working, but I'd go straight to my bedroom. Like I a shell? She was like, yeah, yeah, back I, wouldn't to shell. Sit, I wouldn't sit in my living room or sit in the kitchen. I'd probably make a cup of tea and then just do my work on my bed. And I'll be honest, Billy, it took me about four years to get out of it. Mm. You know what I mean? It, do you think? It's do, you hard. Think, do you think prison cultivates like, um, like loneliness and separation from society? Do you, yeah. do you believe that? Like you know, you they put you in a shell. You're on your own. You know, you, you're living in them conditions for quite some time. You quite you get comfortable with your own in your own skin. Yeah, yeah. And your own space. I I, I was like, you behind four walls basically, aren't you? Yeah. And say from six o'clock of a night right through till quarter to eight the next day. You're on your own. You're in. You're in. You're in a cell on your own. What you do? Watch telly. There's only so much telly you can watch. Read books. There's so much. But nowadays, in 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 some prisons, they've got phones in the cells. Where yeah, no. it makes it a, <laughs> it makes it a lot better and a lot easier for people to stay in touch. But it also makes it a lot harder for some of the young lads who are all paranoid about the beds. Oh, I know it is. Yeah, definitely. You, you've seen it in jail. Yeah. It's like you get jail paranoid, don't you? Even when you haven't even got a bed, you're thinking, I wonder what she's doing out there tonight. Mm. It's just, it, that's how it happens. And people are on the phone, screaming down the phone. So I, I think the phone's in the cell. It's just, if you want to do your beds, it's, it's just get on without it, really. You know what, right, John? I, um, I had my, I remember like, when I was in Walton, they just introduced them. Mm. The phones in the cells, the big like digital, the, you know, the push button ones. Yeah, yeah. And I was fucking hell, they were causing me. They used to go off every 15 minutes. It's got a time limit on them, you know. Oh, yeah, on the ones I had one in um, in Oakwood. And um, it's funny because when they first come out, you know how, how strong the prisons are about you can only have your um, 25, 50 a week to yeah. get your canteen and stuff. All of a sudden, you got a phone put in your pad. Oh, yeah, look, well, what would they letting you do now is spend £50 out of your private cash each month? You're looking at them thinking, do you think I was born yesterday? It's not for, for our benefit, so, they're, so they're, they can make money out of it, it's what it is. Yeah, yeah. But because they're making money out of it, they, they, it'll happen. I, I still say to this day, prisons are one of the biggest businesses in this country, 100%. Oh, definitely, especially with the phone service, because do you know there's queues waiting for the phone? Remember, like you're going back years ago now, right? The phone, the phone cards. Remember them? Yeah, yeah. See, that's as far back as I can go. The phone cards, and then it was the pins. Pins, yeah. I think it still is the pins. I still know my pin number from uh, <laughs> from when I was away as well. And it just caused nothing but but um, problems. What do you think about personal mobile phones in prisons? John? Do you think they would? Do you think one day they'll have them? Is it, they'll introduce them to? Yeah, I, I think, do. You know, I think it'll be. I think they'll be. I think they'll be restricted. Mm. I think they'll be restricted to what you can do and what you. I think, me personally, it's not going to be. People ain't going to be able to phone in. I think they'll do it where it's just a phone out service, and they'll do it where they've got like a monthly um, allowance. Allowance, yeah. yeah. And then I don't think you'll be able to text on them. I think you'll be able to do your prison work and stuff on them. Um, if there's any courses and stuff like that to do, I think they could put stuff like that on them. But. It's going to be difficult, and it's going to be difficult to ever getting phones into, into any prisons. But there's not for them in there, anyway, isn't there? Yeah, there is, like, isn't it? But I think I think it's you know it's good to stay in touch with your family, and it does it does kill a bit of an hour or so overnight. But it also costs a lot of money. Yeah. I remember being on the blue pin phones, and every time your phones are mobile, off it, it take twenty pence straight off. Straight off, it, and that's even if yeah. it went if it went to voicemail as well. So you know, I think it should be like a tariff system in there where you can buy so many minutes a month, you know, like you can out here where you can go and get unlimited uh, minutes out here for 20, 20 quid or something like that, can't you? Yeah. I think it should be something like that. Yeah, because you've got to understand there's, there's inmates who are away that just have gotten nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, they just want to phone, like, the partner and the kids, you know, and, and the only way of getting in touch with them is, is most of is, is a mobile. Yeah. No one's got really a house phone these days, have they? No. You know, so you're ringing them mobiles and bang, you're always going straight away, even if you don't answer. It's like when you're using mobile phones in there, they just... I, I know lads who've got extra 15 and 16 years on top of the sentences they're doing hmm. for using mobiles in there. So really, the, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you look at it, there's a, there's a couple of lads I've, I, I was away with. Conspiracies? You know, with, yeah, yeah, because they've been, they've been using the mobile phones and stuff in, in the prison. And when it's all cell sighted and names and texts get put to each other... If they find that phone, mate, then it's a charge, you know. Yeah. It if you find the phone in there now, I think just a normal phone. Six months. Yeah, 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 six months. I remember sitting in the big boss. 
Oh, had yeah, little, the yeah, they had a little foam, John. Right, I don't know why I took it. I went, went to court. I wasn't like it was a, <laughs> Yeah, it was a Zanko. I was half expecting a sentence, but I wasn't. If you know what I mean, and I my mean, mate went, yeah, I just take that. I just plugged it. Yeah, and it's only small, so you can stick them. That'll be your back office anyway. You know, never, but I had no idea what the um, the big boss was because it never it wasn't. It was supposed to be plastic screws and everything in them. No way. Yeah. It was supposed to be be, be to beat the big boss. Oh, it beat lad. I sat it's down and I said it went it went off. <laughs> you just said you still got a bullet I, stuff I, I, in I, your You know what? I just jump up. I just jumped up like someone had fucking bit me on the arse. And I went like, "Whoa, what was that?" And he went, "Oh, you haven't have you?" I went, "I haven't what?" He went, "Sit back down." But it, 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 I sat back down, John, and I got rad on the edge. You know, for whatever reason, it never went off. Yeah. Went in, had no charge, yeah. <laughs> had no same card, of fuck all, to be honest. I just don't even know why he had it, but yeah. He saved the papers in the end, like. Yeah, yeah. It's one of them things, you just, if you look, it's like a cat and mouse game, uh, prison. It is, isn't it? Remember it's the just, lines going yeah, through? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's like a, a, a prison officer to find drugs on, on, on a prisoner, because that's what it's all about. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's about trying to smuggle what you can in and try and make your money while you're in there, but it's also about them trying to stop you. And I always find it's like Tom and Jerry. I remember that one in all course, Parcel Pete. He just used to go around find them. He'd just find parcels anywhere, him, you know what I mean? This, this is a screw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Parcel but Pete. They're, they're now for an auntie, but look, if you want to start bringing phones and stuff in, into prisons or if you're screwed doing it, then it, 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 the consequences when you get caught, yeah, uh, you know, they'll be heavy. You know, for me, I, I'm not interested in all that no more, me. But you've had like, like so a lot of lived experience, so and a lot, a lot of the young guys come from prisons to your service, don't yeah. they, John? So, what is it that you, with your experience, that you can offer them? What I tend to do, Billy, I go, I go into prisons, yeah. and I'll go in there and I'll do, I'll do open days in there where I'll go and have twenty or thirty people in a room, and look, let you'll say you, you'll say the same as me. There's people who are ready for work. There's people who are nearly ready for work. And there's people who are not ready for work. I'm in one prison and two lads in there, I could see their eyes were pinned. And they still looked, they, and I knew they were on medication, but still in the grip. Yeah, but they've yeah. been put into they've been put into this open day as people ready to go out to work within the next three months. And when I sat down talking to them, I said to them, What have you had? He went, what, what, what do you mean? I went, look, I said, I've been to prison, mate. I said, I've sold drugs. I said, there's nothing probably you can't tell me. I can't tell you about drugs. I went, you're on something. He went, yeah. He said, I'm on my methadone. And I've said, how long have you been away? He's 12 months. And he's still been on methadone for all that yeah, time. Yeah, but what he, he'd he been on 40 mil when he got in the prison. Yeah. But he was still on 40 mil and he had uh, two weeks left to go. And I just said, look, I'm not, I'm not going to feed you a load of crap. I'm going to tell you how it is. I went, I can't support you when you come out because... I don't, I don't do um, rehabilitation when it comes to, to drugs. I said, you need to sort of get to someone and I can sign post you. Mm. But nine times out of 10, they're going out to fail. And they're going in recovery yeah. places when they get out or hostels. And some of the hostels nowadays, I, I don't know how people stay in them. No. Because some of them are around us. Do you know what, John? You picked up, put a point there across about um, the methadone and going in on 40 mils, for example, right? Yeah, yeah. Going into prison on 40 mils, then a year later, getting still out. Still on it. Still on it. Right, now, back in the day, you went into jail, you know, with a habit. Yeah, yeah. And it was cold turkey. Yeah, yeah. There was no, a parachute. Seven days, shut your door, leave you to say Hold turkey. your bollocks, cough. Yeah. You're all right. Boom, crack on with it. And that was how it was done. Now, this that you said, the set's up to fail. Yeah. I see. There's no. There's no way. There's no support. There's no. You know, like way out at all. Do you know? Do you know one thing that really pisses me off? To be honest, Billy, um, I work with category D establishments. Yeah. So I, work, I get. I have a lot of lads coming out of prison every day and going to to work. But what well, after your so if I've got someone a job and they go to work after tax and insurance, the prison take forty percent of the wages. And I'm, it, what they say, it's for the uh, the victims' families' funds. And mm. all right, yeah, I agree. There should be some money put towards the victims' families' funds. And plus the fact, if you're in court and there's a victim involved, so much of the court purse gets going to the victims' funds. And I've always said, look, he's taking forty percent off someone who's going out. And say, for instance, they've got their own four ton a week, and after tax and insurance, they'll probably come out with about two fifty. Yeah. Then the prison take forty percent of that. Now, what I'm arguing with them is, look. Twenty uh, percent, uh, I reckon, will fight to get Suffice, to give to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But let's keep twenty percent. 
to give to the prisoner on release. If you don't, obviously they're saying, well, we don't want to be given cash. I said, well, don't do cash. Do some sort of voucher scheme where people can go and buy some furniture. They can go and put money down on, on, on a flat or a house for rent. They can go and buy tools. They can go and get a van. I said, that's 20% off someone over, if it, even if it's 50 quid a week over over two years, it's a lot of money. Mm. It's a lot of money for someone like like coming out of prison who says, look, I've got I've got a little three grand pit kitty here. Yeah. I can get myself sorted and let's work with the likes of your shelters. Let's work with the likes of your housing people who do all the housing in there. Let's get it ready because we can actually pay a deposit on release. Yeah. And what, one of the main things that's happening is a lot of landlords are getting scared away from working with people with convictions or people from care and stuff because a lot of people just abuse the rent income on it. And nine times out of ten, if you want to get your rent paid to you rather than your landlord, then you can do that by using your credit portal. Yeah. But what happens when you're not paying the the landlord and you're just going out and next minute squandering the that's money? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just it's it's mad, and I think we should we should have a lot more in place for people coming out of prison because we're setting a lot of people up to fail. John, I totally agree because. I think, you know, it's all right, like, going into prisons, offering job opportunities yeah. and all these other opportunities of shelter, you know, um, locations, all that stuff. But what about the aftercare? You know, what's that's, going that's on? That's what's needed. It's, yeah, because, I, you know, we we do something like similar where we're involved with, you know, boxing. Yeah. You know, we're promoting. I've seen what you're doing. It's brilliant. So we're promoting discipline um, uh, and the turn up. But also, there's job opportunities as well. Mm-hmm. But it's not about just going here as a job. After it's getting them ready for it. It's getting them ready for it, and then she and how they cope once they get the wages for the first couple of months. So. I think because that's the, the most important part. You get a wage packet. You've had a break time with a girlfriend. You've had an argument with your mum. Right. The first thing you want to do is go and have a fucking bevy, and an and the Charlie, whatever else comes. You're on that route. So that's where we're looking at, like the aftercare. Mm-hmm. You know. We'll sort the the, gra- the grassroots stuff. We'll work with you, build a rapport, build up the trust, build that relationship up, get you out there. Let's see how you cope. You That's know exactly what you've got to do, mate. You have because some people just think, you know what, we can get them into a uh, get them into employment and then they're on their own. Yeah, yeah. Fuck it's that, having, mate. It's having a mentor service at, at, at when they're in work. Yeah. Now you know as well as I do, if you've just grafted all week and you've just got your first week's wages the week after a four or five ton. Yeah. I'm not being funny, mate. I've just come out of jail. It's 99% saying I'm going out partying, yeah. <laughs> I have it with a few lads, and, um, you know, on the Monday, you get yeah. a phone call at seven. John, listen, mate, I can't go to work like this. I'll say, look, you've got two choices. You made you made a pack with them when you've done all the training for them. Just get yourself up and go in. If you don't feel well, tell them. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. It's my first wage. But I, I'm laughing behind the phone thinking I'd, I'd do the same. But if you want to change in life and you want to go forward in life, if you keep doing that, that wage packet's not going to be there for you to do it. Yeah. And then next minute you're looking at something else then to sort of go go down and get yourself a few quid out of. I always say, Bill, everything has got a ripple effect to it. Like I always say, if you're smoking weed, it's not, you know, a lot of our kids in the city or who we work, a lot of them are smoking weed. Now... It's the, it's, it's the ripple effect of that. It's going yeah. to get the weed. It's buying the weed. You buy it off someone who's who's getting watched and you're going to get ragged on the way out of a set of flats or out of a set out of It's a the house. lifestyle that goes yeah, with it, yeah. yeah. And then if, 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 if plug go past you when you've got a bag of weeds on it, the first thing you'll do is turn around and see where they're going next minute you're on top. Yeah. And that's the ripple effect it has on. Everything's got a ripple effect to it. And that's what I always say to, to people we're working with now is think before you do. Do you know what I mean? Just weigh a situation up of instead of going out or instead of arguing with someone wanting to crack them, just think you cracking them, what's going to do to you? You're on license. Yeah. You'll go back to jail. You'll miss your kids. It, it's the ripple effect of, of just doing something stupid for two minutes when you when you when you're doing instead of thinking. But yeah. if you just think about it, you'll understand and it, you'll you'll have a different view on it, you know what I mean? So it's that having that moment of clarity in yeah. it really. You yeah. need that awareness and understanding because you you know, you know, you know with youth comes the air of arrogance. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's no awareness. You wanna do something without thinking about doing it. So I always say say to the young kids as well about the image orientation. Yeah. Trying to fit in. We talked about yeah. that, didn't we? The Montclairs. Yeah. yeah. 
the all the clothes that you've got the Juventus it's, it's 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 what happens. Yeah, and then you've got the county line stuff kicks in. Yeah. Because we haven't got what you have, but how do we get it? Well yeah, there's a little there's a little graph here. You you tell me out of everyone doing county lines, how many of them don't go to jail? They're on mobile phones. Technology is just getting a lot of them. Yeah, and there's people the getting nicked. Yeah, there's people get. Look, there's people getting nicked for drugs, are getting longer sentences than some murderers. Yeah, you know definitely. I mean? Yeah. So there was a lot of um, after our last podcast, there was a um, there was a lot of like encro chat. Yeah, getting, it, yeah. Remember, there was a big mad bust yeah, in Liverpool. Yeah. What was the young kids? Yeah, I believe um, that was down in um, it was France. They had a server there. Yeah, I think the police got in there in about April. And he sort of had the server. Where well, was it in France? Life. France, I think it was, yeah. I think it was the French and the Dutch police. It's on a joint operation. And basically, everybody who was basically on them, is, everyone's been nicked. Yeah, they were selling these enclos for a thousand pounds each, were they? I think about 1,500. Yeah, 1,500. Some. <laughs> and what were they supposed to do, John? Because, like, they're, they're like, untouchable. I had one years ago on a Blackberry, a PGP, where... It was like sort of you've sent the message. As soon as the message has been re- received, it disappear. So you know it was gone. Yeah. But I think these ones, I, I'd never used one, so I don't know what they're like. But I know that a smartphone, whatever people can do in a smartphone, will stay in a smartphone. Yeah. So I think the, I believe the evidence on on some of the phones that was there was just big enough to go and start taking people off the streets. And, like and, and, and I think what happens as well when you feel that you're untouchable with those encros then chats. That you're sending pictures, your parcels. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done that anyway. But the, 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 there was the John. There's yeah. loads. There's, yeah. You see, it, people are sending pictures yeah. of parcels. Getting. I've been following. I've been following all the news in it. Yeah. And watching what's been going on and pictures taken with loads. And what do you think of people who get pictures taken with loads of fucking dogs, John? Um, <laughs> <laughs> with guns, it? knives. You're out there. You do do but it. You know what the funny thing? I, I'll be honest with you, but like I wouldn't put my face. On anything where there was a gun, money, or anything. No, definitely. Because the way social media is now, you'll get the picture. The picture will go to someone else, and then within half an hour, that picture could be viral. And the police have got it then. Yeah, but you see, you see, like people going on social media and threatening people, and I'm going to kill you. Do this. I'm going to do that. But why do it on on a video? Because the video yeah. is there to put you in jail for the rest of your life if something goes and happens. I know. And you know what? I've watched a lot of that recently on YouTube. There's a lot of YouTube beef going on. There's a lot of social media kickoffs. People calling each other out. And it's like a bit of to and fro. And then he said something. So I'm going to react to that. And yeah, then he yeah. reacts to this. And then he's going to. Then it becomes, well, it becomes really fucking toxic. Yeah. You know? Do you know what? And it's like, don't get involved in all that. No. Whatever, whatever other people do on their podcast. None of my business, business. Yeah. Is their business. And like I always said, Someone says, oh, he's saying this, or he's saying that, I'll go, everyone's got an opinion, let them just yeah. say what they want. And that's the way I, that's the way I see it. And, do you know what, Billy? I'm not interested in any bollocks with people. I just no. want to just be able to crack on, do our work, what we're doing, and carry on. But in, in some places, you go and have a coffee with someone, they'll call you a mate, you walk down the road near the ass like and you're off. Yeah. That's what happens, mate. You can't have an oversensitive ego when nah. it comes to... Um... Look, it's like, it's like us, you'll always... On podcasts, you'll, you'll have... I, I know people who phone me up and gone, John, listen, I've had 500 likes and these two people have done this and said this. And I went, don't bite to it. Yeah. I said, because you've got 500 people who like you and two two people that don't like you, but you're actually... Focusing on the negative. Yeah, you're yeah. Just, uh, just focus on the positive stuff and just leave them to it because yeah. they're it's, only keyboard warriors or people who just want to give you a bit of shit. I think it's easy, though, isn't it, really? Because you want to be liked, you know, as an individual. You know, know, listen... Look at the echo. Read yeah. the echo and then read some of them <laughs> comments. You know, like if there's a normal story on about something, then you'll see like a, a flame where it's fire. I read some of the comments and some of the comments. I don't know why the echo would allow half of them comments to go on there because it's just it's, it's, the it's times just don't right. I tell you what the comments. The, the, the only time the echo turns off the comments is when it's like a fucking it's like it's a paedophile or it's a rapist or something. And the comments are fucking switched off. Yeah, yeah. Because but you know, go, but then there's someone on there. Everyone's getting leathered on it. There's a, there's a few good people on there, but scousers have got humour. Yeah, and the first thing they do is get on and have a little. Switch is the I, best yeah, yeah. for it when you I see. I don't really, I don't really use social media anymore. Yeah. I just, it's to be honest with you, I haven't got the time, and I, I'm dyslexic. I'm not that bad. I can get on with it, but I can't be reading tweets and messages and. Instagrams and TikToks there's not, there's and not stuff. There's not enough thousands. Nah, nah. No, there's not and enough. Y- you know, in in this game, what what we're doing, you need a team to be to be sort of doing yeah. it. And yeah. you've got to have people who are bang on the money. But 
you just keep seeing things all the time and you go, oh, do you know what's boring me that? You've just got to make things different all the time. And I, I, hate, I hate it. LinkedIn, it was, I hate it. I, I, it's not that I hate it. Yeah. I just hate going on there because I haven't got 20 minutes to sit down there and just crack no, on You there. get caught up in, all yeah, the, in, yeah. in, in the questions and the answers and, you know, the ifs and the buts of seeing it. You know, I, 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 I'm I, sitting at home thinking, you know, I want to. Sp- as soon as I'm, my family are there, I'm, I'm with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to be in their presence. You know, I'll try not to to spend any time on my phone as much as he used to. It's getting less and yeah, less yeah. now that I've got my own. It's like me, I'm on the roads a lot. But if you're on the road driving four hours there, four hours back, that's an eight hour journey. You get out, you do your meetings or whatever you've got to do. You're driving back. I don't get time to get my emails for two days, some yeah, days. Yeah. It's just it's just how, how life fits. And now this is this this podcast has been fucking coming for how many months now, <laughs> sorry, but it's just you know what, Billy. Now I, I think we're working all over the country in, in different areas with um, different people. Every there's look, people in, in in our country in our country are always going to go to prison and they're always going to come out no matter what area you live. And being in sort of the northwest Lancashire, yeah. uh, West Midlands, and London, we, we're working with a lot of people and we're working with a lot of like Dane and um, diversity stuff as well. Where down down south. I'd say ninety. I'd say ninety five percent. I'm Birmingham, uh, from a Bain community, and you know yeah. what? It's brilliant sitting there. And I was I done a gas course with um, a company not long ago. Uh, started a twelve week course, and the first day I've gone in there, you can see them all. You know when you walk into a room and there's there's just like a smell, Billy. Yeah. Where it's like prison. Where if people have been sweating or whatever, there's yeah. a smell when you it's walk in. Living, yeah. <laughs> and I've walked in there, and there's twelve of them there. And, I don't. I don't think there's anyone. Uh, there's no one on it white at all. They're all from a Bain community, and do you know what? You know, walking in that I, I go there every few weeks. Um, they go out on site. They come back. But I, I was in there the other week and just watching how they've all changed. All had haircuts. All looking smart. The room smelling fresh. But they're all passing different international foods to each other. So they've become like a little family. And to see that, mate, that's that's what you want. I had one lad who's just fresh out, fresh out. He's only been out a week, yeah. and he's like, "Bro, do you think I'm I'll be able to get on here or what, mate?" <laughs> and I said, "Just get get yourself on." I said, and "Just see how you are." Now it it's not easy work. It's working on the gas and it's uh, external, you know, digging the grounds and stuff. But the, I think up to now there's ten out of twelve of them who've got full time work at the end of the course with the companies they've been out with. Couple of Muslim lads have been on it, and unfortunately for the for the Muslim community, the you've got to wear face masks, yeah. and the face masks are to stop you from getting gas in. So if you're not clean shaven, it, you you can't get on the court on onto the um, job. So we have to try and find them into reinstatements. And as I was having a laugh with um, Abs, one of the lads in there, he went, "John, look," he said, "I've had my beard since I was thirteen, <laughs> <laughs> and I went, to that. he said, no, I can't, I've been thinking about it. I can't shave it off.' I went, "Why not?" He went, "Because I'll only look eighty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's sad. I have a laugh at them all. But I, I, I like working with different uh, nationalities and different people because you just learn so much. Yeah. Up here in Liverpool, we've been locked away from culture, really. Like London, have got it, and Birmingham, have got it." But I think great. there was an. Ex- I think when once the, the European, what's the name, the gates opened, it was just there was an explosion, wasn't it? Yeah, different yeah. cultures. Because growing up for me, I think there was only one mixed race kid in our streets. That was it. I was the mixed race yeah. kid in our streets, <laughs> but there was never any. Yeah. There, there was never any um, uh, different cultures or nothing, you know. And then they, they, suddenly there's the Polish. There yeah. was a lot of Polish, and then there was a lot of everything. Eastern Europeans, Eastern Europeans coming Europeans, over, and yeah. do you know what? I had a, I had a good loads of Polish lads working for me, and. I remember one one guy. I, I you had, bring that diversity, yeah, don't you, John? Yeah. Like Darek, one of one of one of my mates I had working on. Uh, he was Polish when I met him, and there was about eight of them all working. I had a building company, and um, they couldn't speak a word of English. Only the old fella could speak a word of words of English. So I goes on site one day, and there was only about eight of them sitting down eating all food. I heard, "All right, lad." And you know when you go, <laughs> I thought, nah, that can't be right down here. Sound, lad. Yeah. And then I've turned around and all the Polish lads are giggling. Yeah. I said, who's saying that? He went, it's me, lad. <laughs> That's just funny, you know, just watching it. And he, he, his, um, his, his um, wife and kids all lived in Poland. And his wife was sick. I had him here. He was working hard. He was paying tax. And I said, look, why don't you just go and get your wife and your kids and bring them over and yeah. get her the treatment here? Because you're paying tax, you're doing everything right. And he did. And 
His wife, he's here now with his wife and two kids. They've, the two kids have got really, really good jobs. He's still working in the building, doing really well for one of the lads. And his wife's here, she's, she's sick free, you know what I mean? So, Brilliant. and they're living in a five bedroom house on the front in Crosby. So fair play to them, he's worked hard for it. Yeah. But that's how I like to, used to be helping people. And then later on in life, it turns around that you, you you do for a living, really, yeah. don't you? Well, you have done, haven't you? And you've met yep. some, you've met some colourful characters, you know, in your life uh, uh, before you even yeah. be, before you had that 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 opportunity to change mm-hmm. and start giving back to the community. Because you know, I always I was thinking, you know, when I seen that you're on the program that the Liverpool Narcos that should have been called Liverpool Grafters, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You uh, one of you, you bumped into an old friend of yours. You were still in the grip, weren't oh, yeah. he? Was on um, Neil Forum, was it? Yeah. So how did um, was that the lads in the Everton? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So how did how did you escape like the addiction from? Do you know what? Do you know Neil? Yeah. Neil, Neil was at um, he was when we were kids. He was an ABA champion. I always remember. Remember Rocky Three, where he always had his arms in the air. He had the yeah. belt and that on. That was Neil. In, in, in the 80s and the oh, he was a, yeah, he, he was a great boxer, Neil. Yeah, yeah, Fuck and he, he used to always be saying to me, Neil, and his, and his brothers, um, they'd be saying, like, get out of that, get away from all that drugs, lad. He said, you'll never, you'll never have a succeed growing up. And years later, I, listen, I knew which way I was going in life, Billy. There was no choice. Well, there was a choice, but I wanted to take the choice I was doing. And then I goes on, when I was on that programme, I drive through the estate and... He had an Everton coat on with Chang on. I didn't know who it was. And but that just did that just happen? You didn't hundred million percent. Yeah. I didn't know that was Neil. And um, what was it? I said, "Nice coat, mate." And um, he said, "Oh, sound lad." Said something, and then he went, "Said, how are you getting on, John?" And I've stopped, and I was talking to him for a bit. Not knowing who it was. No, and he went, "You know what, lads?" He's like, "You're like fine wine, you, you know." <laughs> but he, he was just one of them. He was brilliant, Neil, and just it shocked. The living daylight to me to know that Neil went on drugs years later and uh, rest in peace now Neil he died he died last year Neil and uh, he's someone him and his brothers are someone I always grew up with and I respected and they were all drug free didn't take drugs didn't want drugs and then look 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 how it got older Neil later on in life was it an overdose um I think uh, do you know what I think with a lot of people who, who were on the gear um, for I liver, the, yeah, I think the bodies just take a toll in it. What what happens? I think what happens now is like people who are, um, are on the gear it goes hand in hand with alcohol. Yeah, so the, you know, I remember years ago when you know I was in the grip as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and I could just about afford the habit as it was. But then you yeah. see people who were on it who, who had the same habit as me, but were still having bevies as well. Oh, and cans aside, yeah, cans aside, like that, yeah. but still, I still think fuck it you know, it's, it's hard, Billy. That. But it's like now. Um, I went to an event not long ago about uh, homeless and what they started saying in there was don't be giving homeless people on the street money. He said because you're just putting them further into addiction and whatever else they're doing. Enabling them. I didn't like, I didn't really like what I was hearing. And yeah. One of my questions to them, I said, okay, I said, but what makes you certain that you can change everybody who's on our streets in Liverpool because some of the people are just too far gone to be wanting or getting help? I said, and the only way for them to be able to get what they need is by begging. I went, do you, do you not give someone a pound on the street because you think you're giving them addictions, but if you don't do it, they're going to die on the street anyway. Yeah, John, do you know what? I, I, I walk around Liverpool a lot, the city centre. Make sure I see. some days. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people that I know, right, that, that I genuinely beg, yeah, yeah. you know, and they, and they need it for, you know, what they need it for, yeah? And then there's a lot of professional beggars out there, you know, yeah. A lot of Romanians, a lot of foreign beggars out there have seen it. You know, they get up and they get the bush, and then yeah. they go to they go to a nice little home. Then you've got like aggressive beggars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the ones who won't take your food yeah, and just fuck, say fuck off, lads. I just want your money. <laughs> yeah, they just ho ho ho, just fucking follow your ass. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's 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 quite sad that we we live in a, in a society today. That but you understand as kids growing up when all our mates were all doing that, and they're still doing it today. That's 30 odd years later. No, no. How, how is someone going to change when they don't really want to? If I see someone out there and I know and I've got a few quid in my pocket and I think, you know what, if I can help him out that day, yeah, I'll, yeah. Do. I'll give him it. It's a, a five or a ten. A lot of them have to pay for the uh, YMCA and stuff, so a lot of them beg to get the money to pay for the YM, a bed for the night, all right, the rest of the money will probably go on swag or, or alcohol or something, you know what I mean? But Isn't that not like uh, free, like in a sense, like the way I'm at Leeds Street, that one no, you mean? No, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure you have to pay on them, you know. Doesn't the benefits pay for that? 
I, I don't think I'm not too sure, Bill, because benefits would. If you think about you it, get, it's like fifteen quid a night. Is it, yeah, your benefits will only pay. Yeah, eight, is it fifty-five to eighty-five pounds a week? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So uh, you do have to contribute towards them. It's like people coming out at, in, into the hostel. I did. There's the fucking nightmares. Them hostels. But you, aren't they? you yeah. go. You try going to work while you work while you're living in a hostel. Yeah. It costs you about two hundred, three hundred quid a week because no. that's what they get paid off the governments to house you in there. But hostels. Loads of people are in there are just getting drunk all the time anyway, or yeah. they've got a, a, an alcohol. There's people still using in them. There's normal people going in them who get put next to sex offenders and stuff like that. I think a hostels, I, I think some of them are just not run very, very well, and there's others that are run very well. You know, yeah. I, I sp I've been speaking with loads of people who have come out of prison and had to go to hostels for at least 12 weeks, but they're signing on twice a day. They're signing on at 12 o'clock and then 5 o'clock. They can't really go to work because you have to pay a lot more money than to stay in the hostel. Yeah. So they want you to stay on universal credit because they get it paid. You know what, Billy? I'll be honest. There's a lot more. I'll tell you what. There's a lot more crooks in in the game we're in now with education and stuff than there is in my old world, mate. <laughs> tell me about I'm it. Tell me now because a lot of people are just asked about a bum on seat. Yeah. You've got to try and look. Not everyone's employable. You know what I mean. But at least you can certainly try and, and do it. If the bodies offer it and they're offer it, then they'll carry on and they'll progress. Yeah. But if they're not, after a few a few weeks, you'll see them just drop drop down or not turn up at work. I've I've done done me um I've done me arming or I've broke my finger. It starts like that, you know what I mean. But yeah. like you're saying before, it's about having that follow on care, the mentor and support. Yeah. Like if you're going into jobs when you come out of prison, I you what we do is speak to a company and say, look, they've got probation. Mm. get them into two weeks work give them a little look at keep them in and we'll get the probation um, lowered down because when you come out it's once a week then it'll go to once a fortnight and then it'll go to once a month but how is someone supposed to do that while they're going to work every week do you know what John it, it's impossible and I was what I what I've noticed in the, in the last few years is like people's agenda yeah you know what's the motive behind help are they actually want to do, do you actually want to help these these individuals you know, progress in life and move forward or are they getting financially funded by some some organisation where they're overpaying their own wages, they're dipping into stuff, it's, um, you, you see it all the time. See funding, Billy. If funding's a fucking big thing, John. If you if you get a pot of funding for the year, yeah. if you don't spend that, all of that funding or the rest of that funding, it goes that, back. It goes back. Now, in some people's minds is, well, we don't want it to go back because we own it again next year. Yeah. But it's the outcomes and the progression of people that you should really be working on. And Liverpool's a tough place to crack, let me tell you. I've been West Midlands, London. Uh, there's different parts of the country where you'll people will jump on you. But let's look at it this way, Billy. To a lot of people out there, don't give a shit who they are, I'm still a drug dealer because yeah. I used to be a drug dealer. And that's the stigma we're always going to have like someone coming out for fraud who's been involved in a fraud case, yeah. they're going to come out and set a social enterprise up. But then who's going to give you the money? Because it's always going to be looking at you. I'm a drug dealer. I'm a fraudster. I'm a robber. Why should anyone give it to you? You know, I, I, and look, I'm five years out now. And to be honest, I've proved a lot of people wrong. But I'm in it to get people a better life, not in it to prove people right or wrong. Yeah. I'll always prove people right or wrong. You will. Everyone will. But it's these people who are just taking the piss and blatantly putting bums on seats yeah. and just not having pr progression for people. That's what gets on my nerves. If, you, if you're offering jobs, offer jobs. If you're yeah. offering some sort of um, certification to get into other jobs, then, then so be it. Look, Billy, there's loads of people we get in. And I'll tell you now, when we put them in jobs, they're not ready for it, mate. But they've got the training when they're ready. Try, you know, try and get into something. It, 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 our stuff, what we're doing now, it's I'm doing it because they're getting good wages and they're learning a trade, and it's a trade that they're going to be able to flourish in over the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. It's it's civil engineering, construction, fibre and data stuff like that. HGVs, warehouse work. It's growing and growing and growing. There's masses of jobs out there all, all the time. Here's a question, John. Like you've been out five years, right? You have you've like you've excelled 
in every area of your life. You've you've done everything to the best of your ability mm-hmm. to um, to get job outcomes, create job opportunities, uh, learning the law. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's that's a five year period. Right. So five years ago, did, did you ever see yourself in this sitting down in this no. position, going like this is what I've done? No. Right. And two years of that is COVID basically locked and shut down. You're not imagine five years just, in a bedroom, yeah, are you? Just ma- thinking about imagine, it. Imagine having a full five years run on that where you'd yeah. be now. You'd be flying. Where it's like the first couple of years we were just ready to start flying on it and then COVID come and then it was like starting again oh, yeah. but with all your contacts. Do you know what I mean? And I'll be honest, I get companies phoning me left, right and centre wanting to work with me, wanting to try and get in wanting, but they're not ready for it no. because I work with companies now who have got me back and it's like social media, putting stuff up who you're working with. Billy, the amount of people who just go behind your back, <laughs> mate, and try and swim in. But you've got that much you've got yeah. that much of a um, of a rapport with the companies. The companies yeah. phone you and say, Do you know blah blah? I go, Yeah, yeah. So they've just been in touch there trying to do this. I went and what did you say? So, no, if you want to do it, go through inside connections or they're the people you stick with. Yeah, yeah. Because people with integrity. Yeah, yeah. Because they'll, some some when Just, some some people are not ready for for working with 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 people with convictions, and when they first get into it, it, it sort of it scares them a little bit. And that's why getting a three month report with them and stuff like that yeah. is just the best thing. And you see it now. We've got we've got got loads of, of employers and companies we work with nationally, and they're brilliant because they've got your back as well, and they love what you do. Yeah, but so well, boils down to when I, when you mentioned that about say you know changing and redemption and you know not having that label mm. of, as a drug dealer um, or a villain, you know that's the label you're attached with when you get out of a prison, mm-hmm. you know, in a society. That's yeah. what you know yourself as. You wear them labels yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't need other people to tell you what you, you, you've done wrong because you know what you've done wrong. Unless you continue to go down that path and, and still commit crime to fund whatever, or fa- whether it's financial gain or yeah. whether it's you're funding a habit, then yeah, you, you know, you're fucking bang on. Mm-hmm. But when you've changed and, and you've proved people wrong, which I believe we have, myself. Yeah, 100%. You know, I'm here. You know, I'm sitting down, I feel like I'm doing something, you know, positive in the community. I don't take any money off anyone. I get involved. Um, I like to, I like to build relationships up with young lads and, and girls who, yeah. who who are struggling. And then he can identify with me yeah, and go, Bill, yeah. what was it like for you? How did you get through this? And the reality is, all you've got to do is keep breathing, keep moving forward. You know, don't pick up that first drug because that will lead on to this. Yeah, yeah. We talk about gateway drugs. You know, a gateway drug to me is, is alcohol, cannabis. Yeah. You know, it leads on to to the to, to severe consequences with its class A's, and then I'm down. I'm down, mate. My partner, who would now she's never once seen me with a drug. Yeah, she's yeah. never drank nothing. And she's. Oh, I couldn't even imagine you. You know. That's that's the thing. Isn't <laughs> but, you know yeah. what? She doesn't fucking know what I'm like. If I if I if I have something if I put something in, I just I don't know what happens to me. You yeah, become yeah. something else. It's not that I become got someone an else. Person, yeah, but, um, where you're getting onto. Yeah, stuff but and... I just become something else. So I was like, whoa, and I've had that many um, like experiences that I, I'm quite aware of where that takes me. And this is something that like you know yourself and, and, and myself could we could do with kids out there or young lads, young girls, whoever, um, and show and share that. Yeah. That experience. That's what it's all about. It is. Look, listen, kids who are going down our route or are on the way down our route would yeah. rather sit here and listen to me and you and other people who have done the same than sit there with a teacher and try and get them. Don't get me wrong, some teachers are brilliant. Yeah. What about but, celebrities then? Yeah. I think celebrities have a big... Um, influence. A big, yeah, a big influence, especially, especially if they come from... A background like uh, like us in the like kids. sport and backgrounds, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they've had, they've had an all, all sport and backgrounds. You like you like Tony, Molly, yeah. everyone who you Paddy, work yeah. with, and um, Paddy, yeah, who are all supporting you to to our kids on our streets. They're all icons, you know, because oh, they're all involved in fighting. Hard, yeah, yeah, but they're involved in fighting, and you know, in this city, it's a fighting of football. It's a fighting of football city. Do you know what I mean? It's not there's not rugby or stuff like that. It's always been fighting of football and. 
I think listening to people who who like yourself and and Tony and and the rest of the team, I think it's ideal. I think it's brilliant. So what are, you know when you share some stuff with you know obviously you've had to sit down with a few of the lads in the classrooms and that and you've shared a little bit of your experience, John. Mm-hmm. Where do you begin? Where did you be, where do you begin with that? You know, because you've you've had a few hairy moments in life, haven't you? You've had a, you know, you've had money that's like you, <coughs> you've had that much that you couldn't even fucking think of yeah, yeah. where to put it. I just know? be open and honest with them. But do you, know, do you want me to be honest with you now? You know, going into into like places now, if yeah. I'm going into do open days, especially out of town and stuff, I, they just think I'm a normal tutor, a normal teacher. It's when I start to open my mouth. I can't sit in a classroom, Billy, because I start getting agitated and that. But I, t- I take the piss out of everyone in there and I have a proper screen with them. Yeah. And everywhere I go, they all start having a little laugh and buzzing because I, I say, look, I might have changed the way I am in life. I said, but as a person, I haven't changed and I won't change. I said, I'll sit here all day and take bollocks off you and I'll give you it back. And that's the way I do it. And when they find out, say, look, I've been to prison, blah, 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 they go, what, you've, you've done jail? And like you've just been nicked yeah, like yeah. back and find Yeah, because <laughs> they just think you're a normal sort of person. Yeah. And then when I tell them what some of the things I've done, they're like, what? I go, yeah, I grew up in a different world. And then I show them a picture of what I used to be like, and they're like, it just looks like two different people now, you know? So I, I enjoy it, I have a buzz with them. And then they tell me about uh, bad drugs, and I'll I'll go into a story. Then I'll say, look, when I done this this time, they go, and they're looking at you as if to say, fucking hell, is this guy for real? But yeah, I've done it. Because you've mixed, you've had a few uh, mix up with them, um, you know, like the, the Middle East as well, haven't you, John? I remember Rob. <laughs> yeah, big shout yeah. out to Rob Butler. Yeah, he, Rob. he said, you know, you, you, he, he told me a story. Can't really recall it. Though. You can remember it where like. You know, you, you were in this like really vulnerable place with all these. Yeah. I think it was the Turkish yeah, yeah. mafia or the Albanian I'm mafia. I'm telling you, who it was like, no. but it was in uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. And um, what happens is, when I was doing uh, the cigarettes, um, I was working with uh, a guy. He ended up turning out to be a grass anyway. But working with him, um, he'd set me up. He'd set me up to um, Manchester Airport to pick a couple of people up. And I ended up picking them people up and it started where that was the very first time my face was ever seen and it was at Manchester Airport. But the two people, I took them to the hotel, uh, looked after them, he didn't turn off for two days. So I knew there was something fishy and I knew he was he was robbing, he was robbing stock off every wagon that was coming in and I was saying to him, you, you, you can't be doing that. I said, that one day is going to come on top for you. And I didn't know the people who had met anyway. And then a few weeks later, I got a phone call. And they wanted me to go over and see them. Now, <clears throat> I was talk- I talked to Robbie about it. <laughs> and I said to Robbie, look, there's, there's two ways that's, that's going to happen. I said, I'll get ironed out over there. Or it'll be an opportunity that we can't really turn down. It'll probably sort of put us on a, on a good path to earning some good money. And he was going, nah, Bertie, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> and I had to sleep on it and I phoned him back the next day. I went, you know what, I'm coming. And I ended up going on my own. Um, I got picked up in... Um, was you shitting yourself, John? There was part of me, look, Billy, if, if you've grew up like us, there's part of you that you're not really arsed. No. There's part of you that... <laughs> Arrest. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're thinking, look, if I, if I don't make this decision, you make decisions on, on your head... I, I thought about the situation. I thought about my time when I spent with two of them. And yeah. I thought, you know what? I think I feel confident enough to go. And I, and I went. And um, I get off I get off in the airport. Uh, when it comes out, there was a code name I was to see this fellow with. And I've gone over seeing him. He's took me out. put me in the back of a Merch limo. And um, we're driving through a city. And when you pull up by the lights in these cities... Or a kid start jumping on the car, starting to you know to wash the window screens and stuff. This fella didn't say a word for about twenty five minutes, all the way from the airport to where we're going, and he's just wound his window down and whack one of the kids, and I've gone whoa, and he's turned around and gone shh, and I've gone oh this is it, I'm dead, yeah. and um, he ends up taking me up in into a big house and into the mountains, and um, I'd I'd spoke to the guy's wife because she spoke English, the guy didn't. And when I got up there, I'll be honest with you, I had a, a normal phone and I made a phone call for a minute 
and just never never talked on it just just in case anything did happen there was a location of where i was and as soon as i got out the car i just got welcome with open arms and um the house was just <laughs> this well by the way <laughs> and i've gone in there they come in here, they were oh, they just treated me really good you know, they took me to a restaurant in the night time and um we go those three hands we were in the middle and he was the car behind each and bearing in mind he's got armed guards everywhere yeah and i didn't know who he was at the time until we walked in that restaurant and we walked in the restaurant it just stopped and everyone stood up and i just went i said to his wife i went who is it <laughs> and don't bear in mind i'd only met them sort of twice yeah before we'd gone to the restaurant and she said i'll tell you later and um, they ended up just being just silly, naughty people, but they were brilliant. They treated me with respect mm-hmm. and they looked after me. And I remember one time there was um, half eight the next morning, I get rushed out of bed, get oh, put yeah. in the back of an uh, X5 <laughs> and get flown into the city. And they put me in a big hotel there. Everything was paid for. And the manager come over, he went, look, um, I know your name, John, uh, blah, 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 anything you need, you're in the presidential suite. He said, you can have anything you want, so I'll pay for. I went, all right, sounds. Three days I was there without any contact or anything. So what do you, what do, you do? What do you think? You just, your head's going a million miles. The paranoia is kicking in. Yeah, yeah, and you're ordering all kinds of foods. and The last meal and yeah, everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you're going out and you're going out to places where you've, you, you, you don't know where you are there because out, outside the motels and stuff on the streets are just nuts. Yeah. And I um, stayed there for three days. And then they come back for me, um, sat down with them, um, done, a, done a big deal with them. And um, they went, they gave me ten, uh, five grand and took me in the um, Cartier shop and bought me and my missus a brand new Cartier. I each went, that's for you, <laughs> and give that to your missus. They, they were brilliant, really, really nice people. I think that Rob was saying that they were, you know, it was, it was getting to a point where I think you had to make a move from that transition where it became from cigarettes then to heroin you know it was like well it was heroin was always your early early stages in life yeah yeah because but for us billy look 80 84 85 86 it's the biggest way isn't it yeah so that's where your heroin started coming in and started taking control of people and started ruining lives uh 87 88 89 90 ecstasy had come in it's like cocaine yeah yeah so that sort of like cocaine when we were 15 it was a rich man's drug. Yeah. O- yeah. Us up here, we'd, we'd take whiz. Down in London where they had the money to go and spend, they'd, they'd the be cocaine. taking coke. Yeah. People who were earning money up here were taking coke. And then the tablets kicked in then for probably in the early 90s. I think tablets sort of slowed down a little bit when I think it was Leah yeah. Betts died in about 1993, 94 or something like that. And that was with uh, Tony Tucker and that, you know, when... Um, Pat Sait. Yeah, yeah. That was with the down with the lads from Essex and yeah, I've got a I've got a, a live event with their cat and Leeds coming up. So I I'm going to go. Up yeah, comes that, out that'll be here, um, yeah. that'll be uh, interesting, John. So he's he's Carton's really good mates with a lot of my mates. Yeah, who, 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 a lot of my old mates from London. Have to get all, yourself down. Yeah, John. they were all all old school, but I know Carton was really good friends with one of my mates, and I've met Carton I think a couple of times in the um, probably in the late nineties when I've been yeah. with Dave and the Circus Tavern and a few of the lads and. I met, I met a lot of people down there, you know, that me and a... Robbie, me and Robbie knew Robbie a lot of people, because he, he was with Lenny McLean down there. You with Roy Shaw? Well, I know, because we'd met, um, we'd met someone through Lenny, and uh, from there, then we ended up meeting like the Tony Lambriano, we'd been out with them all, Charlie Richardson, Roy Shaw, he, he, he's, Roy's brilliant, he was just, I'm still very good friends with someone close to him, you know what I mean, he, he was, he was brilliant, Roy. Yeah. He was up here, they stayed up on us. He's only small, weren't he? Small. Yeah, proper handful. But he was an handful, <laughs> yeah. Even in the 70s, you wouldn't have even wanted to have a fight no. with him. Pretty boy, sure. Yeah, See, he, was, he was brilliant. So now, Tony Lambriani, I, I really liked Tony. He I met his brother, Chris. Chris, yeah. yeah. But I really liked Tony and um, really good fella. And I, I remember goes down, I, I'd like, I, I would really met Roy in that. I was in um, Kensington Park Palace Hotel watching a <laughs> boxing event. <laughs> and... Um, I just, I'd, I'd just gone upstairs and I'd gone out up and at that time I was snorting and that anyway. So I'd gone in, I'd had a snort and I got myself together. Obviously after a snort, sometimes you need to go for a, to, to go to the toilet. So I've got in a lift and unbeknown to me, there was Charlie Richardson and Roy Shaw in the lift. But to me, they would just look like two older fellas where I was only in my twenties. Yeah. 
And next minute, I couldn't hold it in, so I farted in the lift, haven't I? <laughs> and uh, he, he said something, I went, oh, sorry, mate, he went in the fucking scarcer as well. <laughs> and then I was just giggling with them, I had a laugh with them down the lift. And then I goes downstairs um, to go and uh, get put on my table. And then um, my mate come over, he gone, John Luckill introduced him, he said, this is Charlie Richardson, Roy Shaw, Joey Pyle. They were, all of them were on the, on the table. And that's how, that's how I got to the, meet them uh, with Robbie and that years ago. But we used to go down there all the time. <laughs> I'd have Nigel Ben on here, Dex and that, Barbara Windsor. You'd have all of them down there in parties. It's fucking bizarre, I remember, going to, I remember going to a party there years ago. Uh, we got invited down. And you know when you pull up outside somewhere and you just see 18 Bentleys and Rolls Royces, you know you're in the right party, don't you? Yeah. But it was full of all... Um, old, old time gangsters, your Freddie Foreman's, everyone. The party was just berserk, but... When, when you're a scout and you're like, oh my, I brought a load of mates down, with, down there with us and they were like, there's thing over there, there's thing over there. But you know, scouts are like meerkats, aren't we? Yeah. I was saying, there's 20 scouts together, it's like a meerkat man. Yeah. You know, don't like that. Yeah, are that <laughs> so we well, get everywhere, scouts, I love it. So when when it was like the, the ecstasy years coming, because went like you said, you've just gone through like the, the heroin, the, the worst, the coke, the, the heroin, yeah. and then the ecstasy and then the Bets and Tony Tucker and... You know, do you remember, you remember that, that that Essex yeah, yeah. fucking mayor yeah. that was quite it was national news, wasn't yeah, it, at yeah. the time? You know, that um, that changed a lot of things. It's a change, it, it, to be honest, it changed where people were. But you know what as well, Billy? What you changed? had a lot of violence though in Liverpool as well. Yeah, but what that changed? Time. What changed? Yeah, television changed. More news was getting out. Uh, there was more reporters getting sent all over the country, all over the world, so stories were coming out quicker. Yeah. And if you notice now, like social media, within something, within minutes of something happening, bang, it's all over the place. Isn't yeah, it? you don't need to and fucking wait for the news. That's out even more about things. But yeah, it was, um, so you go to what, the late 90s, and they started getting heavy on the jail sentences then. And then in the late 90s, it was sort of Siggy's, I was cracking on with Siggy's. You wouldn't think though, John, I know you spoke about this on the first podcast, but you wouldn't think cigarettes would give you the big sentences, would you? Well, it doesn't. It didn't when I was. Now it would. Now it does yeah. because what this country sort of look at is it's money. It's money. It, everything's about money. It's a proceeds of crime, confiscation orders. Um, this happened with the mafia years ago, where when Tax. you got arrested, yeah. they seized all your assets, and that's where they've seen it now. And when I got arrested, I got arrested in December two thousand for the, all the cigarettes. I got sentenced in two thousand and four because something went right in the case. And the guy I was telling you about before who introduced me to the two people from abroad I was the, working with. The grass. That was the first time. So he kept saying to me in court, I can't do jail, I can't go to jail. He was an old man, uh, not old, but he was oldish, Jewish fella, Jewish, but he was Scottish. And um, he come from a Jewish background, but he was always saying, I can't go to jail, I can't go to jail. Now, the evidence surrounding him and the, one of the Asian people that were with us in, in the courtroom was astronomical. And me and Robbie were talking. I said, you know what? I'm going to put a PII on him. I said, because I just don't... Something's not right in this case. So, my solicitor, um, David Phillips at the time, he'd gone in and asked the judge to the PII. So, it's where it, it's public information in it. They had to tell you. Yeah. And the next day we got to court, they'd um, dropped all the charges on him. So they dropped all, yeah, they dropped all the charges on him. So, one, they couldn't bring up a PII then, could they? So what David Phillips done for me, he went in and got him. Um, he said, I want every cigarette case this person's been involved in in the past sort of 10 years. And when it comes, seven seven cases he'd walked on. But even there was a guy from um, another foreign country, George, really, really lovely man, old man. But he knew his game. He was a cigarette smuggler, but he was he was massive at it. And how I got nicked, he got nicked exactly the same. He'd send someone again. Oh, I'm stuck on the motorway. Can you go to the airport, pick these up, or pick him up? Yeah. So he'd done it exactly the same. So after that, we'd found out he'd been involved in seven other cigarette cases and walked. And it's like it's called agent provocateur. It's where like he'll work on his own and earn money, but he'll also. Uh, work with the customs and put so people be blow, in. So blowing yeah, everyone yeah. up as well. Yeah, yeah. See, that's it. When you, you know, we we all know when you're grafting out there that you know there's no integrity. With a lot of people are scared to go to jail, Billy. Yeah, you know what I mean, and that's why a lot of people now are doing deals with police or grafting people up because 
half of the people go in and go, look, I, I've got information. I, I can give you this or I can give you that. I want a thing that I'm staying out of jail. And um, is that something that the police do, John? You know, because I've never had to be in that situation. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you haven't seen it. Because I know you're not a grass, so I know that. Uh, but, but, you know, is they, have they ever come up to you, John, and said to you, look, if you provide us with information, we will look at reducing the sentence or... The, the low, they'll always try and do that, but what they will do is they will never do it to the head of an operation. They'll do it to people underneath because it's the people underneath that they want to, to grass you up. Yeah. Because basically to grass, if you're a, you're at a, um, a lead, a lead role. role, yeah, there's no one really above you to sort of throw you in, yeah. But Billy, look, mate, when you're earning money and you're driving around in different cars and you're flaunting watches and being a being a big boy, as they would say, a <coughs> flash fucker, yeah, then people are getting jealous of that. But while people are getting jealous of it, there's phone calls getting made, there's police finding out stuff. It happens, mate. People don't like it. You know, it, 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 yeah, I don't know, and it's quite um, it's a fucking bit of a like it's. I was I was in I was in prison with a lad. Um, I'm not going to mention his name, but Scouse kid, brilliant he was. Yeah. Um, got hired to kill someone, and he went and done it. He got paid for it, and the kids who paid him the money to do it got Nick four years later with drugs, and when he got nicked with them, he'd probably been looking at about a six or an eight billy. Yeah. And what he's tried to do is say, look, I've got information and I know something on a murder years ago. And basically, he's thrown the kids in who he paid. The kid got lifed off. He thought he was getting away with it. He got a, he got about 10 or 11 years and hung himself the same night in prison. So where, where does it take you? You know, you've got to live. You've got to live with telling that tale for the rest of your life. Yeah. And nine times out of 10, you're going to have to be looking over your shoulder as well. Yeah. But in, in this world now, growing up years ago, Robbing houses and grassing on people, especially in our city, was a no go. Yeah, you look at it now, mate. They just don't care. There's people's no. houses getting robbed left, right, and centre, and there's people grassing each other up for the sake of it. Exactly. Yeah. It's silly, mate. It's a fucking. It's a different world we live in. It's today. not a criminal world to be in at the at, at the minute. Or I'd, I'll be honest with you, I don't think it's a very good world going forward being involved in criminality because you you will get nicked, and especially if you're using phones and stuff. I think. It's, I, do you believe it's going to become a cashless society, John? Yeah. I believe it's going to become a cashless society and I think the government will legalise cannabis then because in the black market, if you want to buy weed or any other drugs, you'll have to use a card and you'll have to use it to a drug dealer. Yeah. If the drug dealer gets caught, then the police have already got all your information. Because what, what, what are the... Um what other sorts of like currency can you use? It's 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 going to be impossible, isn't yeah. it? Unless it's yeah. gold, jewels. They're going to say cryptocurrency, this, that, the other, um, yeah. the dark web stuff, stuff like that. Bitcoin. Why do you want to do that to go and buy a bag of weed? Yeah. You know, look, <laughs> look, Billy, we're still the biggest growers in uh, and exporters of cannabis. You know what I mean? England's uh, probably one of the biggest exporters of cannabis, and they buy it back in because it's bought government. Yeah. Um, from I don't know whether it's Theresa May's husband or someone. But the export here and the imports are straight back in for medicinal purposes. It's it's a known fact now that it does help people who've got Parkinson's disease, epilepsy. It's getting prescribed by doctors. So I think in two or three years, if there's no cash in this in this country, I think nine times out of ten they'll legalise cannabis so, because they'll earn that much money on taxes on it as well. Have you thought about the fact that if there's no cash, there's no crime? Well, I won't be putting a bulldog in um, coffee shop anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. It's the way the world's going, and you look at phones. Whoever thought that phones could track you constantly? Like I speak to people in jail, I go, "How did you get nicked?" I go uh, cell site. I went because you had a phone in in your hand that you were grafting off. I said, and "You had an iPhone in your back pocket." He went, "Yeah." I said, "Because everywhere you go, them two phones are together." I said, and I was talking to a lad the other day who's not who's on trial soon, and um, he said, "Yeah," I said. I've done it. it, was up with a phone, but I had another phone by it. I've just told him I got rid of the phone. I said, all right, I said, who did you phone that day? He went, what do you mean? I went, did you speak to your bird? He went, yeah, yeah. I said, so you spoke to your bird and that, driving up to, to do a drop. Yeah. And did you, did you speak to them all? And back, he went, yeah, I was on the phone for, for ages. He went, so how can you tell anybody in a court while there's a jury there that that phone was lost, someone else must have had it? Was this someone else phoning your bird for an hour on the way up and your bird for an hour on the way down? Yeah, it's fucked, isn't it? I said, you've got to think about this. I said, because one fuck up while you're, you're on trial, if that comes out like that, I went, they're not going to believe anything you say. It was like the Iceman, weren't it? Yeah. You, um, what's his name now? He killed Massey. Um, 
old Mark Fellows, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. that, that was he meant the real Ice Man no, there well, in America. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, well, that's what his nickname was, Mark, the, the Ice Man. Yeah. He, he's, um, I, know, I know Mark, I was in jail with Mark. Mark fucked up with the, uh, the GPS yeah, on his yeah. watch, weren't he? Yeah. See, I right followed Boyley, that case. The kid Boyley as well, who was with him. I was, I was in jail with Boyley. Boyley was just... From Warrington? No, Boyley was from Manchester. Mark was Fellows from Warrington. Mark was from yeah. Warrington, yeah. That was an heavy case, that, mate. That, yeah. was, a, that was a fucking alley. I mean, there was nothing... You'd you think that they were doing it to perfection, you know, watching it, setting it up. But like he you said... on his watch. Nicked on your mm. watch. Like, we've just, just, just been talking about it, John. Mm. You know, crime... Right, the smudges, you know, the, the, the smudges now have improved. Yeah. You know, so all the cameras yeah. are fucking, you bang on, you can see blackheads on your fucking nose, mm-hmm. everything, right, they're on to you. Yeah, your phones, thinking about cashless societies. Yeah. Do you think crime will stop, the crime rates? Will, well, I, I won't say it'll stop, it'll, it'll stop. never stop, but do you think it'll reduce massively because of no money? Do you know what I was saying before? It's like a cat and mouse game. No, yeah. I don't, because our, our prisons have all got to be filled. Yeah. So why would the fuck would they fill them? Because it's a business, like you said. Look, look, I know people. In then mind. again, there's going to be like I met, a, I met a lads in jail, right? Just two normal fellas. Just you wouldn't have even put them in jail. They were in jail because they bought a project in America that said on the label in America that if you paint it on roofs, it keeps the heat in. Yeah. And someone took them to court over it. They both got eighty eight years each, and they both got a million pound fine. <laughs> so where's the justice in that? I know travellers who are getting nicked because they haven't put enough tarmac on a drive. Again, they're getting pockers because everything's down to money. If you look when proceeds of crime comes in, they'll look into stuff that once you've been nicked doing something, whatever's in that bank or whatever's around that bank they're going for. And they're quite clever on how they do because if they sign you off as a pound, you'll always have a benefit figure. But that benefit figure then can come into action any time in your life. So if they say, well, we'll sign you off now as a pound, but we're getting you a half a million pound benefit figure. Yeah. So what that means you've is never had that money. if you ever come into that money or you've got assets in your name or you've got anything in your name that's worth a valuable amount of money, we can actually come back and take that legally. You know what I mean? Yeah. So once you're, once you're in the criminal world and you've got a pocket or you've got some sort of... Um, proceeds of crime on it and um, benefit figures stuff like that nine times out of time your, your life's you're not gonna, you're not going to be able to do anything really for the rest of your life because if you buy an house you, you think you want to leave it to your kids actually you can't because you know the you know the government the money yes you're fucked, you're fucked yeah that's what i said and there's a lot out there that know that these pockets are on them and they're fucked yeah and the, but you know what there's people are different billy and you know growing up you know, it's hard out there for some people and the way you've got to look at it is what did you do as a kid to get yourself a night out to go out and buy some clothes especially when you weren't working or yeah. you, you, your parents uh, living apart or I always, I always say when you get an individual try and go back some parts of his life where you'll know they've changed do you know what I mean and look at the backgrounds of the parents look at the backgrounds of something happening in school or look at the background if they lost someone close to them because that's where it all sort of starts yeah that's the you contributing I mean? factor yeah, isn't yeah. it there's always there's always something in the background that's contributed to the current situation yeah. I've, I, you know i didn't just wake up one day and think i'm going to be a fucking raging junkie yeah, yeah. and fucking commit loads of crime to fund a habit that i didn't really want yeah uh, i was uh, that's uh, my, my dreams were I wanted to be be a fucking great boxer and join the army yeah, stuff yeah, like that yeah. things that I wanted to do but obviously it didn't because this came into play and then I looked at why it came into play and this is like years later so like you said John it's like when we go back to like um, you know, what happened for me it was like there was there was a lot of shit with my dad at home he was drinking yeah. a lot of alcohol he was beating my mum up he was smacking me about a lot I didn't feel there was any love or empathy or compassion or understanding or anything yeah. going to school really insecure and feeling vulnerable and not being able to interact with everyone else in the classroom because of what was going on at home. So then I was getting bullied and, and humiliated and embarrassed mm-hmm. by other kids because I never had the same clothes as them and I was quite poor. You know, there was a lot of us, there were six and I was um, I was the oldest and we never had all this. You know, so I had all that going through all school and then feeling like really less of myself. Didn't think I could get a fucking job and, mm-hmm. you know, I had no skills and confidence. It, it, that alone was before I'd even committed a crime. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah. So I've had all that going on. There's a lot of pressure on your head, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot. That, all that's going on. 
before I've even went out with you. And, and I committed a crime. The first one was for clothes. Like you said it, right? I wanted, I met a girl, had these fucking shit pair of jeans and a fucking jumper and I thought, I can't, can't go on a date. Like that, yeah. Can't go on a date with her like that. End up robbing fucking uh, like a car stereo and wheel frames mm. and selling them. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the blowies <laughs> and from the from the uh, the F Reds fucking yeah, Fiesta, oh, yeah. That, yeah. And I'm selling them, yeah, getting a little bit of grip and putting that on and and then she, she was like, Oh, they look nice yeah. and then okay, sure need some more and and then what happens then? The part's fucking gone down, and it you know you you're trying, you're trying to to impress press a beard and yeah, stuff like that. But that's, that's where it was with me. Effect. You don't know what's happening along the way while you're doing it. No, I'm sure. But yeah, you spoke about that. That's what's happened. It's gone from that to that. Now I've got to a place. I'm, I'm 50 next year. Yeah. Fucking hell! I can't even believe I've reached that age. I'm 52 so, this year, me. Fucking mate. hell, John! I can't believe, and I, and I believe now that like I've got to a stage in my life that I've had to go through everything, all those experiences. Walk through the mud, the nails, the pain, the fear, the feelings, right? To get to this point in my life where it goes, you know what? I'm okay with myself. You know, I forgive my dad. I forgive, yeah. you know, everything that happened as a young kid to me. You know, and I believe that I took respons- I take responsibility and I'm accountable for my behaviour. Mm. You know, I was driven by a, an, an addiction to, to, to create fucking, like, I was, on, on, I was suicidal yeah. every day. That's- You've got to remember as well how, like our dads who grew up in the 60s and the 70s, you've got to remember how they got treated when exactly, they were kids yeah. by their mum and dad. And he never spoke diff- to me about that. Yeah, it was a different world yeah. because people, you know, at them times, you get a smack off your dad, you can't do that now. No. You know what it's I mean? Get a fucking eye. But the thing is, you you look at stuff that's happened over the years, like telly, fucking hell, Jim will fix it. I wrote him a letter years ago. I'm fucking <laughs> glad he didn't fucking come for me. But that's the effects. That's what it used to be like yeah. them, them years because you could get away with it or you thought you could get away with it. Yeah. And then years on, you see it now, it's just, it's all blowing up, isn't it? Yeah, and like watching that, I was seeing that recently, that Jimmy Shovel, and I'm thinking... He, yeah. But nothing funny, Billy. Just look at him now when you're older, you think, fucking hell, you wouldn't let your kids near him anyway, no, would you? No, but fucking hell, he was a proper weird fucking narcissistic, egotistical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that the way he was, weren't he? But, the but big guy, now, as but a everyone kid, loved him. But as a kid, we used to run home at yeah. sort of six o'clock fucking on Saturday Jimmy will to fix watch Jimmy will fix it, didn't we? Yeah, he fucking didn't fix fuck yeah. all for me, and I'm glad he never, to be fair. But that's he always it. had the little slogan, he's not, uh, what was he saying? I was a man next And you had Ralph Arastraw and Dick's going, can you tell what it is? <laughs> know what I mean? And what was the other fella, Stuart All? Ah. It's a it's a knock one out, do you remember him? Yeah. Well, you notice they've all got little slogans that yeah. they sort of lived with, you know what I mean? And you look at them now and they're just fins. You've got an odds like the the, the 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 Prince fucking Andrew, the lot, the yeah. whole fucking like everyone we all brought up that we idolised Gary Glitter, everyone. I don't I don't know. I'm not admitting to idolising Gary <laughs> Glitter. <laughs> yeah, no, no, neither <laughs> Michelle, but I mean everyone who, who grew up like idolised someone in that fucking place, you know, then that's, it turns out to be fucking, like, fucking, I don't know. Naughty it is. Naughty it is, it is. And there's a lot. That's what I'm saying about them eras. You know, you, your dad... The 80s, yeah, the yeah. 70s, the 80s. Like, when I was a kid, if you'd done something wrong, your dad, your dad would give you a bloody smack. Nowadays, you can't, you can't do that. I think I read one of the comments, John, uh, talking about, I think when we were talking about, like, growing up in the 70s or 80s or whatever, and someone said, you know, and it was tough, it was tough for whoever it was for, yeah, at the time, yeah, yeah. it was... You know, someone made a comment about it. Oh, well, it wasn't tough for me and I didn't go down that path. And okay, you never. Yeah, yeah. But did you have the contributing factors? Yeah, did you grow up the way we did? Did you have all those? Was you influenced by other things? You've got to like, like that. You've just put it into into play there. You know, there's a lot going on in that ripple effect. You know, like it is like in the communities today, one individual can create a lot more harm in, in the yeah. community than a group of people yeah, together. Yeah. Like I do a set, I've done a survey with a few different uh, groups of lads. How many people, so if we had 10 people in a circle, how many of them people do you think were in prison who come from council estates? How many people do you think were in, were in that circle who come from middle class? And how many people do you think who come from high class? Yeah. The, the average is the average is, is your council estates because that's where everyone's finding it hard. Mums and dads are finding it hard. Not, not nowadays, but especially when we were kids with yeah. jobs and stuff like that. But in different areas in Liverpool, people move to them areas because they had jobs to move to them areas. The crime yeah. rate in them areas Gattaca. was low. Fucking Walton. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. So Crosby. people who have done well for themselves, Billy, have done that now. Yeah. What what do we do? You know, to us, it's when we go to like Sefton Park or down to Allerton or, 
you know, to different areas in Liverpool as a kid, and you're looking at their houses, you're thinking, I want one of them houses when I grow up. It's the first thing you do. Yeah. And then that sets you on your path then to be wanting to become or wanting to be in and money to do it. But in, in a world, you've got you've got to earn money, you've got to be with certain people, you've got to be around certain people. Yeah. And them certain people all come from the same background as you do, whether it's criminality, drugs, whatever. And then nowadays, it, it makes a circle. And what they'll do is they'll have a piece of the web where they've just arrested someone with a couple of bags of weed or an ounce of weed then what they'll do is they'll put a squad on him and then that squad then will escalate into into the bigger circle where they'll start getting like the middlemen until they've got the end the end where the the end goal is the lead and roll and that's where they're going and that's when they've got enough of everything just go back. Do you know what it was like you know years ago John I just, I just remember something you were talking about them the squads I used to um, live down the south end and there was a Lawrence Road mm. Used to go up and down a lot of sold all the time, and I was there was a shop, sports shop that had just opened out the blue. Fucking, you know, shows all the Henry Lloyds and yeah, all, yeah. The, all the belts of clobber and that. That was going about that time when in there, uh, like fucking hell, this is new, isn't it? Two two out of time, two fellas. I thought they were gay. They were just dead, dead, dead close. Um, and they say, how long has this opened? And they said, just a few months. And we're trying to establish this business. And, you know, we, we've got one in blah, blah. And, you know, this is our second one. And we're trying to build it. And um, I was like, okay. So I was, I'll try them jeans on. I'll put these pair of blue fucking any lights. She said, yeah, go in the back room. And in the back room, you know, there was a table. It wasn't a dressing room. It was just a, it was like a little room. Where they had a cup of tea or something. You know what I mean? It just changed. That's probably what was going on. And it was a fucking wallet on the table, right? I'm not messing, right? So and it was shocking with fucking fucking dollars, right? It was just shocking. And I was in, I wasn't really in it. That sort of got me shit together for a little bit because there was brief periods in my time where I was like, oh, the fucking hell, that's, yeah. like, that's like putting cheese on yeah. the table in front of a mouse or exactly. something. Exactly, right? <laughs> but it was there and I didn't sort it right. I thought, I was just, I said, a bit odd. You know what I mean? Tried them on, got off, got the kicks, got off, told our kid about it. Our kids went down, he's fucking broke in anyway, right? Robbed the shop. Um, <laughs> then, there's, um, then there's these kids that have got into these these two fellas and started talking to them, getting friendly with them. Now these ones are tablets, John. Yeah. These ones are tablets. These two, um, these two fellas, won't be known to anyone. They were busy. Yeah, yeah. This is a shop front. I did yeah, that. Yeah, it's Yeah, it, and it, that's what they fucking done. And the kids. Mm. I remember. I think it was Leroy Gilbert, or one of them. His mates. He would got nicked. Couple got nicked on a conspiracy. You know, like getting loads of yeah, fucking yeah. Um, loads of tablets down, and then going to court. Do you, do you think that is that still happening today? That kind of stuff, yeah. John. Yeah, two of my mates. Um, not, I wouldn't say today, but definitely in um, two thousand and ten. Yeah, it happened to two lads I know, and they got set up to the highest hilts because they had a name, and I wouldn't even mind. They weren't even doing anything to do with that life basically beforehand, and it was the it was the squad dude who purchased a cafe. It it said. You know, befriended them, become mates yeah. with them, started setting all big stuff up, and then when when it when it happens and the drugs were there, then they all got arrested. I think it was fourteen, fifteen, sixteen years. That was a big one, wasn't it? Entrapment, because they yeah. used to do the police used to do a lot of that with um, with cars. Yeah, like you'd rob the car and it'd um, turn yeah. itself off six, <laughs> 60 feet. Down yeah. the thing. yeah, there was a few. Remember, there was a few of them. Yeah. Look, I look. I've been look. I'm not an angel. I'm not Mother Teresa. I've done a few fucking things that I shouldn't have. But there was you a point. Stings up everywhere. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But there was a point right, right, John, where the, the police would pull up next to me, right, and this is true. When I'm up to sixteen or seventeen, you know, and they'd go, "Look, Bill, pick a colour. What screws are you want? Do you want that blue one or do you want that black one?" And I'm like, "What do you mean?" He said, "Because we know you've just been interfering with that motor vehicle over there. Because yeah. it was like it was a uh, it was UTMV back then. It's swat now, isn't it? Taking Pretty neck for that. I don't know what yeah. of a yeah. Motor so vehicle, it was like yeah. you know we're, we're, you're interfering with that motor vehicle. It's a UTMV. You know we're, we're arresting you, and you know. And I was like, I'm sitting outside, fucking like on, on just outside Oak Street on Maryland Street, yeah, waiting yeah. to go into a drug service to pick up a prescription because I'm fucking trying to get my shit together. Yeah. And they're arresting me and I'm taking to this, the, the police station because I'm in a bad way. I'm throwing my hands in. Yeah, yeah. I'm pleading guilty and yeah, they go, we'll yeah. give you bail, just throw it there. And that's fucking... It's just, a good, it's just a good thing, isn't it? Oh, that's shit, the way they used mm. to do all that stuff. I had a few bitter resentments towards them. I did speak to a few busies because I remember getting picked up, John. Right, and this is on my mother's life. God forgive me for saying this, right? I got put in the back of a fucking... These Jack's cars, right? Four of them, two in the front, two in the back. I'm in the middle. They're twisting me up now, right? I'm only a young kid, right? And they're really fucking going to town on my list. 
bending them, screaming, and it's painful. Who's doing the graft bill? Who's robbing? Who's doing this? Who's got the drugs? Didn't know anything anyway. Mm. I wasn't in the know. I was just a fucking junkie trying to fucking score. So I didn't have any idea what was they going on. They play on that, didn't they? No, they did. Mm. They took me to Newsham Park, right? One of them got out of the car, unfolded it, got a towel, unfolded it, and had a gun in it, John, right? I stuck it in my mouth, right? And I wouldn't swear my ma's life. He said, I'm gonna fucking he said, I'm gonna blow your head off. And I knew it wasn't, you know what I mean? I knew it was just a scare tactic. And then you've got the other one saying he's got HIV, this this butter busy, and he's gonna bum you. And I was like, What the fuck are these all about these? Trying to get info like that. Mm-hmm. And then these just fucking jumped me outside Newsham Police Station. Yeah, left, yeah. Newsham, you know, no, just put me in a shell. And then because he had a warrant. Just fuck horrible things. And all that bit in his and uh, and it just ate the plot for Yeah, and it was the OSD, John, back then. Do you remember them? Yeah, I remember it, yeah. The odds and shots. Mm-hmm. Now, it's Matrix now, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so I don't know what... I, I've had a few chats with Biggies now, and it's it's a different relationship I've got with them, mm-hmm. which is... It's a positive relationship. But the thing is, when when you grow out of that criminal world, they don't, they, they don't, they're not your enemy because no. you're not doing nothing to hate them to do something to you. Whereas when you're in that criminal world... You can't stand them. No, could just, one could, goes could past you or one tries to stop you. You start. Yeah, even e- even now, even now, when I'm fucking busy, he's behind me, rising me, and I'm driving. And I've got my license, got me everything legit. I still feel like it's a fucking shark yeah, on me yeah. tail. I think, what the fuck? All of a sudden, me all and you still think I've got anything in the car yeah. when you know quite well you haven't, but it's still in your minds, and you go, shit, shit. It's weird, isn't yeah, it? That yeah. feeling that they've got over you. You know, but well, I've, it's, like, it's growing up of many, many years of doing that. Yeah. It's, it's not easy to just walk out of it, but I don't care if they're behind me anymore. Yeah. Because I know I've got nothing in the car. I'm I know it's enough. I, I know we haven't done it, but initially yeah, I've got yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, then I become aware and go, but like like I said, that relationship with the police, because we, we've gone along, we've done a lot of topics here, it's been quite good. It's like that relationship with the police I've got today, they ask me questions and I've told them that story. Yeah. And they've like, what? But you, you look, police, a lot of police were corruptible in yeah. them days. Yeah. And nowadays, very rarely. You're, you're a lot of good cop, anybody. bad cop, weren't it? Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of that going on. Like you remember like the Sweeney and all that, and yeah. you know what I mean? They were the days where yeah, fuck, yeah, people, were, batter, yeah. <laughs> people were corruptible. Yeah. You know, I remember I remember the um, thing going years ago, and I'm trying to think of it now. There was about, there was about 300 people arrested, you know, for um, paying a copper for information. To see if there was anything on them and stuff like that, and I, um, I remember the the guy, um, the cop has gone in putting names in, but they had a camera on them, yeah, and they watched them um, putting all the names, and they arrested them, arrested all the lads. Oh, they had a lot when it was like cases, yeah. yeah. The, the busies and everything were on, you know, they had them in the back pocket and everything. But nowadays, because of the technology and and all this stuff, they have s- cyber security stuff in in computers and stuff. They don't. Yeah. No, it's very very difficult to do it. Yeah, we're living in a we're, going, we're in a changing world, John. Everything's fucking. But you know, some places it's changing for the better. Some places it's changing for the worse. It's like it's like everyone with sort of people coming into the country. I, I don't I don't mind people coming into the country if they want to come into the country and they want to work and they want to pay the taxes. Then I'm all for it. But let's not be people who are saying get them out, shouldn't be here, blah blah blah. Look, every I always say in life, everyone deserves a chance, and if you're me personally, if I if I knew someone who was living in a in a country that was affecting them bad, but we could do something about it, and yeah. I'll try and be that person to do but it. But then there's on the on the on the other side of that coin, John. Right, the prison population is full of a lot of foreign nationals that have oh, committed yeah. heavy duty, heavy, yeah. heavy duty fucking look, crimes. Like if you're gonna let if you're gonna let people come in into this country from other different countries, they don't live the way we do. Yeah. And part of their lives is robbing. Part of their lives is is um, killing people. Part of their lives is being involved in drugs. Part of their lives is being criminality. Different places in the likes of Europe, all over the world, always have different ways of doing stuff. And when you bring them into a country, it's civilized, it, yeah. it, then all that becomes in 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 where they are. Yeah. Because if they get into selling drugs, they won't care, they won't care twice about stabbing you because no, they used to and, do it and in, the, in, in their country. No. Yeah. You know, and that's what you, you see a lot of now in prison, a lot of like different kind of like multicultural gangs. Yeah, I start, you know what, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know about you, but I enjoy prison. I enjoyed the banter of a daytime. The worst part about prison is when your door gets locked of a night and you know you're not going to tuck your kids in or you're not going to go to sleep next to your bed or whatever. 
But at the daytime when you're open, it was, look, they're putting people like us in a place all together. And it, you do have some laughs in there, Billy Tonkin, you know what I mean? I have yeah. some proper screams in there. And people coming in every day, you see them coming in, their faces are everywhere. They've got a tooth in there. <laughs> and you, you just look and you're thinking, fuck. I remember walking the first day. I got the first time I got sentenced properly in um, in the in just in just after two thousand. I'd walked into Walton, and it, I just looked around. It was just like what the because you walk through. You used to walk through B Wing to the um, you had yeah, the four, yeah. four landings, didn't you? <laughs> and the block ones and like eat. Yeah. But then you are looking up and there's people bouncing everywhere. What's happening, lad? And you're just like. <laughs> Fucking hell, what is this? <laughs> and you, the, you know, you've got once the once the judge puts that hammer down, you can't sit there and mope about it. You've just got to go right. There's that. I know what the I know. That's course, my sentence. Yeah, yeah. That's when I'm getting out. That's when I'm heading towards this. And you just crack on and do it. Yeah. But you've got to make the most. You've got to make the most of it while you're in there because if you don't, you 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 won't get through it. No, you you're know, right. Some of the stuff you see in there, it's just, it's fucking No, mad. I do, I, I agree, John. I mean, growing up for me, like, as a YP, a young offender, that is, that's, um, you know, the initial instance into a prison establishment was quite fearful and, and, and was just daunting, yeah. to say the least. But then you get into, you get into, you adapt, mm. and then it becomes like a family unit, you know, and then there is a yeah. bit of banter at the, but at the end of the you know, I, I never had no way... Um, no, no, no ties anyway with anyone. Yeah, so yeah. going to bed for me was like the, probably the best time of the night because you'd be at the window shouting and, and this, that, and the other. Um, and yeah, you do once you once you start once you've like established yourself as an inmate in the prison system. Yeah. You know, and you're watching everyone else coming. You just know, fucking glad that's not me. Yeah, you know. But then you're, you're coming name, to the end. You're coming time, to yeah. the end, and it's like, <sighs> but then it's that circle, and it's, it's back in again. Mm. It's like, like you were something. talking before about the encros. There's people our age who are getting sentenced now on the mencros and they're getting 20, 25, 30 years. Over. You know what I mean? So that that to me is, you, you put nine times out of ten possibilities, you're going to die in prison. Yeah. You know For what I mean? Who wants that? No, not in this day and age, not in an age know, We've, like we've that, got an out in life. We've, yeah. got, we've got our families in that out here now and I don't think... I don't think there's anything in the world put in front of us, Billy, that we'd we'd take to change that. There's nothing, John. You know there's I mean? nothing, mate. There's no temptation that you could put in front of me that would put me back in prison today because, you know what, at, <clears throat> at, at this age now, I value, right, yeah. what time I have left. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're blessed. We're blessed with a few short decades, John. Yeah. So it's, it's important just to make the most of that and not spend it behind a fucking door, banged up with someone you can't stand. Or getting an Im- a padmate every show often. I've had a few horrible yeah, bastards yeah. in my few horrible like fucking controlling fuckers that are nearly battered, um, and it, some of them that still owe me money. And I hope you're watching this, mate, because you're out there. <laughs> I've, listen, I've got the same. I've had some out there who still who still owe me money, and just yeah. I've been in touch with them when I first got out, and it was I'll phone the police. I don't even want to give them a name, yeah, but I'm, to be I, honest, now Billy, I'm like that me. I'm not yeah, interested in it no yeah. more because you know what? It was fucking criminal money anyway. Yeah, you know, so leave them to it now. <laughs> Up the rotting, rotting bloody hell and dying yeah. shame of it, you know what I mean? I'm not bothered no more. I've got no remorse to anyone or any anything from that past life. I don't care about it no more. So before we finish, John, what's what's um, what's the future got in store for you now? You know, you've done, you've got, you've spoke about a lot. But what are the plans now? So for now, is um, companies we've been working with for the past like three, four years, five years since. We've been getting people into into uh, jobs and stuff. We're getting opportunities with them. So the supply air uh, subcontractor work, um, we're getting offered opportunities all the time to sort of jump in with them and build something out of that. And when you run a charity, Billy, it's really difficult because you're always looking for that bit of funding and that bit of funding and that bit of funding, and it's really difficult. But when you've got drugs attached to you, it becomes that little bit more difficult. Yeah. So over the years, I've seen in this game who are snakes i've seen who do it for the right reasons i've seen who do it for the wrong reasons and i'm actually in with a few companies in liverpool birmingham and london that are really really good at what they do and they've supported us they've stuck with us and they're the people we're working with we've got a uh, contracts now on civil engineers and um, a lot of fiber work where we're doing a loads of housing we've got a uh, company we're working with digital infrastructure They've um, they've brought us in as a partner to run a full uh, PIA training school, which is a state of the art one getting done in Newtonley Willows. 
uh, all the gas in Wensbury, and then we've got all the st- all the traffic management, and we've got a national um, contract with a massive haulage and logistics firm now, and we've just got um, our first four lads from prison started there. We took them Amazing. in for inductions yesterday, and like I said to them, four lads going in, I went, "This is it's not just a test for you, it's a, it's a test for us and for you." I said because if you get this right then there'll be another load of people that we can take out on rattle and put them into jobs and let them support the families. Because when you're in that last two years of your of your sentence and you're in a Cat D prison, you can go out and work. Now, if you've been a main breadwinner in your house, but you've got a bird and three kids, you're doing four years, then two of them are going to be behind the door. Your bird's going to suffer that big time. Yeah, yeah. And your kids are going to suffer big time. But at least... If you've gone to prison with no money and they're suffering and they're finding it really difficult, for the last two years, you've got the opportunity to get out, work, earn some money and send some money home to your family each week as well, which I think you'd want to do. Yeah, And that's what I said to these, I went, look, use our, the faces of incessant our connections and the prison system in this. I said, because everyone in the haulage firm have been amazing they've been they've supported it there's been times where senior management have been like standoffish and you know can we do this can we do that they've worked with us we've built it with them over the past like five or six months we've been in prisons with them we've done everything and it's 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 flowing now and hgv that's flowing as well so for me it's 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 getting on to the people who want to support you the people who believe in you the people where you can get funds and to help other people get into into work properly and getting the qualifications they need, getting the uh, right practical they need to get on site. So for me, it's about progressing with all these companies and big shout out to like digital infrastructure who've just been absolutely yeah, yeah. immense. Wilmot Dixon, they've been fantastic. You know, I could go on forever. I've got our little Michmach Paddywach who's um, <laughs> he's he's come on the civils with us now and. He, you know what he doesn't know about fiber and training and stuff he's he's brilliant and my business partner marie and um, my son ben you've met you know yeah, our ben, ben. So yeah. they're yeah. running uh, ben and olivia and ollie and the team are all running the cic brilliant. me and marie are all running all the employer stuff and the subcontractor work and then we've brought proper good people in who, who know how to run fiber who know how to uh, do civils and you know, it's it's building and it's it's you've achieved, building really you've achieved well. a lot, John. Fucking hats off to you. But I know the thing is though, you, you've got to look at it is I done it when I was in a in a criminal in a criminal way. Yeah. But nine times out of ten, Billy, if we go into something straight, we can do it there as exactly, well. Exactly. Yeah. It's about networking and it's about speaking to the right people and getting getting into them where you know what they are and they know what you are, but they respect you for and you respect them because they believe in you and they want to help you. All them other companies I've worked with over the years who have better been off, I've been them off for reasons. Yeah. They don't give a shit about people who have got convictions or they're interested in is putting people into their jobs to put them into work and when the work stops they'll fuck them off just as quick. So it's working with the right companies. Yeah, so for yeah. me, it's about growing and growing and uh, uh, I reckon in the next few years we'll be going pretty, pretty big and it's having, the right, it's having the right team around you. And do you know what I that. always say, Billy? I don't get involved in other people's bollocks. I'm not yeah. interested about yeah. other people's bitchiness with stuff. I just thought, you know what? You do what you do. I do what I do. Yeah, and I just yeah. carry on and do it, mate. It's the best way to be. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, it's a cost. It, well, you know what? Like someone says to me, you know, like years ago, you'd have them, they were having beef with someone that go, fucking hell, you shouldn't be speaking to them. I'm having it with him. And I go, yeah. but what has he done to me? I said, he's been my mate since I've grew up. Yeah. I know, but you're either with us or you're with them. And I think, what the fuck's going on here? So you're, you're you're so I had that, I've had that, I've had that, yeah. I've had that recently. And then, like this world, I said to you, this education world, this training world and all that, <sighs> tell you what, mate, if it was 10 years ago, I'd be knocking fuck out loads of people, Billy, <laughs> honest to God, I would. But I think before, I think before I do now, mate. I do, and, think before you yeah, do. Yeah, and then it always works out that you can always go like that, like guarantee it'll go. Told you so, didn't I? Yeah. And like all these people who think, because like now I've had a few people saying, John, you know, if you give us this, I'll make sure you get that contract. And I'll go, are you mad? I say, look, mate, I went, there's only one way I'm flying and that's straight. Yeah. I'm not going to veer left and I'm not going to veer right. I said, because me paying you backhanders or something like that is going to put me in a situation. I went, 
I'll tell you what, I'll decline your offer, mate. You just crack on. I'm pretty sure I can get on with my team a lot better and a lot straighter than, yeah. than you will anyway. And it always comes back and bites you in the arm, Billy. Yeah, it? it's awesome. It's awesome. You know what I mean? It's awesome. Well, brilliant. Big shout out, by the way, to KR Couriers and Transport Limited while we were on that one. Roger, thanks for that, mate. Roger, and, uh, the Dodger. Uh, Roger, the Dodger. Uh, well, so, me bird gets on this one, John. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it the other day she does the edit and she's like oh look at you again and he pales the wisdom <laughs> so like I, fucking, I, I thought it's easy to add but anyway what would you say pales the wisdom John is there anything you'd say to a young John Burton walking through the doors of life if you had the opportunity like one sentence one word something you could you could offer what would you say to a young John go the this? other way brilliant instead of going the way you're going go the other way because look I know a young John Burton and I know an old John Burton and believe me, you look at the sentences I've had, 23 years totality, yeah. all right, I've had early guilty peas often, but it's a long, long time. Do you want to go down that route? No. Go to work, earn your money, because in that time you've been away, you can come out, you can have a lovely house, you can have your cars, you can have your kids, you can have everything you want. It's, it's you know, you might want a quick fix, but... That quick fix could give you 10 years. Just think about the next move you make. Brilliant. So I would. I'd just say them that way. And with that, John, thank you very much for coming on.